Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Energy News Booth Daily Stand Up. My name is Stu Turley, President and CEO of the Sand and Sound Group. And I'll tell you what, today is September 11th. Buckle up. We've got an action packed show for you today. Before I get into the stories, I want to give a shout out to Ananias. He has let me know that one to two nuclear explosions were used to frack oil and gas wells as part of the peaceful use of nuclear. Today, on September 10th, on the day that I'm filming this, marks the 54th anniversary of the second test of the nuclear fracking of natural gas wells in Colorado. The first was in New Mexico, and a third was in Colorado. Here's the funny part. The gas was unusable because of nuclear fallout. Not a good moment in history for <laughs> fracking or nuclear energy. So anyway, hats off to Ananias and follow him on Twitter. I'll have his handle in the show notes there. Let's get started with Germany. The green energy transition is only getting worse. Oil prices tumble as traders turn bearish. OPEC drops 2024 crude oil demand forecast for second straight month. China has more than 1 billion tons of coal per year in new coal mines in their pipeline. Boy, there's some net zero about to happen. Harris wooing U.S. Steel after pushing extreme policies to torpedo the industry. You can't buy this kind of entertainment. And then Michael and I are going to talk about the, coming up the debate. And uh, he and I are going to talk about what the candidates thought about energy. So let me get rolling here into Germany. The green energy transition is only getting worse. What's happened is the green energy policies are just absolutely making it miserable for you have green energy policies, high energy prices go around. There is a wonderful chart. Miss Producer, if you could bring this chart up, you could see Europe versus U.S. states. 1 through 88, and you take a look at this list, in the top of the highest, most expensive energy is Hawaii, Belgium, Germany, Ireland, Liechtenstein, Italy, Cyprus, and California comes in at number eight. Rhode Island at number 10, at number nine, Massachusetts at number 10, Connecticut at number 11, number 12, Maine. That's just amazing. And then New York is in the top 22, Alaska's 20, Portugal, Vermont is 24. You start taking a look at there is a 100% correlation between green energy, the Green New Deal, and high energy prices and deindustrialization. Let's go through this here in some numbers. Renewable power sources covered about 57% of Germany's gross electrical uh, consumption in the first half of 2024. However, generation from renewables reached 147 terawatts, but at what cost? And it has been considerably more than you'd have to pay. They took down two of their last two nuclear reactors that were already running, adding to the baseline cost. So Volkswagen is now considering closing factories in Germany for the first time in a move that shows that a mounting price in Europe's car maker faces from Asian right rivals. VW considers one large vehicle plant and one component factory in Germany to be obsolete and said it works council vowed to fierce resistance to the executive board's plan. I'll tell you, they're having some serious problems and deindustrialization is the direct result of green energy policies. Hey, let's rumble on to the next story here. Oil prices tumble as traders turn bearish. Hedge funds and other money managers have reduced their bullish bets on the oil at the lowest level since 2011. This is pretty an amazing story from oil price and WTI saw last week its worst weekly performance since October 23rd with an 8% drop for the week. On Friday, WTI and Brent settled down at their uh, lowest levels at 67, 67, and 7106 per barrel. 
And now let's take a look here at the next story. OPEC drops 2024 crude oil demand forecast for second straight month. This one is from David Blackman and Forbes. The bottom line, David's bottom line is this month's report from OPEC comes after a month that has seen the international Brent price fall by 15% as traders seem to be pricing in anticipations of slowing economy, along with expectations that larger OPEC plus group will begin the process of unwinding some of its voluntary production and export cuts in fourth quarter of the year. It remains to be seen if the continuing softening of the global demand will influence OPEC plus to delay their efforts. Now, great points from David Blackman. And then from Professor St. Ange, he had an excellent point. And when he says that the stock price for Dollar General has taken such a hit because even Dollar General customers are running out of money due to the higher economic impact of the Biden-Harris economy, so he said, basically, you have, uh, he was very, Professor St. Ange was very funny. He said, basically, you have Walmart, then you have Dollar General, and then you have the dumpster. And if people are not buying in Dollar General, uh, it means the next stop is, is shopping in the dumpster. So that means that is a very valid line to take a look and say, wait a minute, if you can't even afford groceries Why is the economy not already in a recession? I like the way that he had phrased that. Let's go to the next one here. China has more than 1 billion tons per year of new coal mines in the pipeline, the report says. This is nuts. China is developing enough new mines to produce 1.28 billion metric tons of coal each year, said the report by the U.S. Global Energy Monitor, Jim, which included the large mines with at least 1 million tons of annual capacity. It said that 35% of that capacity is already under construction, meaning a surge in production is expected in three to five years. Quote, expanding coal production capacity is a currently a national policy and priority and a political task. At least they get energy security. Now, China's existing mines have made it responsible for 70% of the global mine methane emissions from similar large mines, and all of the proposed projects are completed, this would rise to 75%. So you're taking a look at the mining of coal. Natural gas could eliminate a lot of this problem and be a lot cleaner solution instead of burning coal, but it is because it is so prevalent. Anyway, there's a lot to be said for sharing our great natural gas resources, even through uh, LNG. Last story for this before Michael and I talk about the debate. Harris wooing U.S. Steel after pushing extreme policies to torpedo the industry. I got tickled at this story. This story was first out on the Federalist. And when you take a look, the original project, 19, 2019, U.S. Steel committed to investing over $1 billion in the Mon Valley Works project, but withdrew two years amid in part pressure from the climate activists, which is also very much in Harris's camp. And, and is, but it's Harris's radical environmental policy agenda that emboldened the same climate change party activists behind the disinvestment of the Mon Valley Works project that would have improved jobs for these very steel workers. So by Kamala Harris's supporting of the activists over the economy, it has then crippled the steel industry and you cannot have an industry in 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 making jobs happen for other manufacturing without steel. It does not happen. So now why not put some of that money into making cleaner steel? I can get on board with that. Let's have a little bit more expensive steel than having to buy it from China. I'd rather buy U.S. steel, make it cleaner, and build it here rather than just shut it down and force us to build 
and buy steel from China when they don't care about the environment. This is about pollution. Let's get, let's, as Chris Wright has said, let's eliminate energy poverty with the least amount of impact on the environment and be fiscally responsible. So with that, hey, let's hang on and I'll turn it over here to the, the Michael and the, the team here in just a second. All right. Well, we just got done watching the debate. Wow. A lot to get into. We're going to try to stick to energy, but I'm sure if you follow Stu and his Twitter account, we're going to very <laughs> far off the reservation. But uh, sorry, I had to say that, Stu. But I want to acknowledge first, we've got a guest appearance. This is the first guest we've ever had on the Energy News Beat Day. Yeah, our, yes, R.T. Trevino. I am honored to have you as our We are honored guest. to have you on, man. I can't believe I'm here. This is, I'm so sorry. You know, thank you guys so much for even asking me to come do this because this is the show that has no guests. You guys, your listeners, wow. Just thank you all so much for the opportunity and what a show it was. I had my popcorn out. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I mean, we will get to it all in a bit, but I want to go to the tape here. We're going to, we got to start and pretty much focus the entire segment on the two band, two frack or not to frack, whatever it's called. I'm pretty sure that's what Shakespeare said or not to be, but let's go to the tape here real quick and see what had to be said. I made that very clear in 2020. I will not ban fracking. I have not banned fracking as vice president of the United States. And in fact, I was the tie-breaking vote on the Inflation Reduction Act, which opened new leases for fracking. My position is that we have got to invest in diverse sources of energy so we reduce our reliance on foreign oil. We have had the largest increase in domestic oil production in history because of an approach that recognizes that we cannot over rely on foreign oil. Thank you. My family lives in Western Pennsylvania where fracked gas wells have become a common sight, yet the toxic impacts of fracking on the community are immense yeah. from contaminated groundwater to poisonous emissions. Yeah. Will you commit to implementing a federal ban on fracking your first day in office? adding the United States to the list of countries who have banned this devastating practice. There's no question I'm in favor of banning fracking. So, yes, and, 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 starting, and starting with what we can do on day one around public lands, right? And, um, and then there has to be legislation, but yes, and this is something I've taken on in California. I have a history of working on this issue. And to your point, um, and, you know, the, we have to just acknowledge that the residual impact of fracking is enormous in terms of the impact on the health and safety of communities. Yeah. So thank you. So would you ban offshore drilling? Yes. And I've, again, worked on that. <laughs> well, all right. I've got my thoughts on that, on, on specifically Kamala's thoughts. But I want to kick it to you. You're the guest. What did you think first of that segment? And then you can you can taper off to, to whatever else you want. I could tell there before you played the segment that you really want to keep us on track here. This isn't a three podcasters walking to a bar where we let Stu kind of go off into his own place. You know what? Here's my thoughts. President Biden said a lot of things during the campaign trail and did the exact opposite when he became president. The only reason why we do not have inflation as high as we do, uh, as high as we did or that it didn't go higher, is that they backed off killing the oil and gas industry, okay? So I wouldn't put it past them that, I'm sorry, this administration would only not would only continue to wage war against the oil and gas industry and the hundreds and thousands of Americans out there that have jobs in that industry or that are affected by the oil and gas industry. I understand the two frack, not to frack, the flip-flop, the this, that. And I'll say this, I, I get a chance to do interviews on wonderful shows, not quite as awesome as Energy News be, but I usually answer a question. I, I get every now and they tell me, you know what, if you cannot answer the question, and wow, both candidates did a pretty good job of that tonight, not answering some questions. Kamala definitely, on the other hand, answered none of them. But from an actual 36 second clip right there, the best I can say is we need to have affordable energy, oil, and more importantly, natural gas can get us there. So we need to definitely be pro oil and gas and continue to work towards alternatives because it's an energy addition, not an energy transition. And that's really the best thing that I can say as our good friend Stu Turley is chomping at the bit there. 
Oh, I'm, I'm going to be quite honest with you. I thought Kamala did a very good job. I thought that I was very surprised. I did not hear the actual cackling that I was expecting. And she lied about 19 times. Bold faced lied. Miss Kamala, if you want to come on this podcast, you're more than welcome to defend your lies. Because when she said that she wasn't going to frack or she's not going to ban fracking, they have. The Biden administration has banned fracking in Alaska several times. She signed, she was the signing bill of the Inflation Reduction Act, the single largest reason we have inflation. My dad just bought 20 gallons of paint and it was a hundred times more than it was a previous three years ago for the same paint that's inflation. She's also lied about not going after fracking and ruining the the environment. They have also filed an appeal on the LNG ban that because the Chevron deference is it been kicked in, they filed another appeal. They want to ban fracking, excuse me, LNG going out and you got to have fracking in order to get our LNG exports out. So she is lying and she would kill the entire industry. Well, I, I yes, I clearly that she's not going to say, I think what she really thinks, which who knows what she thinks. She says at one point she was going to ban fracking. Now she says she won't. You know, everybody seems to drift to the center in an election. I think practically it's going to be hard for them to for them to actually pull off. Like, I, I like to think things of tactically. Like, how do you actually tactically go about banning fracking? Well, you'd only have to start with federal leases. The problem is it's what, like 70 percent of all oil and gas production is on and, federal leases. So you're do, you'd actually and, skyrocket. And, and I want to jump on this one while, we, while we're here. I'm going to I'm going to take this this right now. She signed, she bragged about signing in those leases in those Gulf oil leases. Guess what? Not one of those leases has been approved. I just talked to the API Gifford Briggs today, Mm -hmm. and not one of those with the API have been signed or drilled of the new leases because of the regulatory policies that she put in. Her administration is shut down drilling. So- She can ban fracking by not approving the leases. Yes. So I think I don't know where she stands on any of this. We (laughs) we, we know where Trump stands on a lot of stuff. I want to get to him in a second. I do think to steel man the argument, whoever's coaching her did a great job because her point on what she kept bringing it back to was we want to get off foreign oil. I can't disagree with that. I'd love to get off foreign oil too. Right. So, but but you can't do that. Banning fracking is not going to get us off foreign oil. You want to get off foreign oil, you got to turn the taps on, baby. So there is a little bit of like, okay, well, you want to ban fracking and that's going to get us off foreign oil? No, that's going to get us importing a lot more yeah. from Russia. So it is a little bit of a catch-22. Now, RT, I got tickled when and he said that Biden killed the Keystone pipeline, but then he approved the Nord Stream and he then bragged about blowing it up. Yeah. You know, what what are your thoughts on like how many individuals out there tonight that watched that debate truly were swayed one way or the other? You know, I, I joke saying I got my popcorn ready, you know, because it's obvious, you know, as you just mentioned, that should be something right there alone that millions of Americans would look at and go, man, that's anti-American to kill American jobs, but then promote a Russian pipeline, okay? Whether or not whoever blew it up, getting that out of it, you know, take that out of the equation. The fact that somebody killed American jobs and then approved Russia, you know, is one thing. Not to mention the fact that this administration sold hundreds of thousands of our barrels of oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to China when all they do is preach that China is bad. And guess Um, guess whose company was that? Well, we can get into that too later on another episode. Uh, That was the Hunter Biden's, if I'm correct, right? That is correct. But, you know, uh, Michael, you also brought up the great point about, oh my God, the banning, the fracking, oh, production, that, you know what, we are still producing more oil today than we were during the Trump administration. So can you imagine where production would be at today if we were at just 50 more rigs 
than we were a year ago today. That I mean, wow. Can you imagine how high our production would be and how much of a fight we would be having against OPEC right now? You know, I've said this once or twice before, before you go, we're fighting right now, especially here in the great state of Texas, we're fighting OPEC with one arm behind our backs and we're still keeping the price where it is. Well, That's ask, amazing. I mean, I look at it this way. RT, you're, you're an operator. You're about to pick up a rig next week. We're going to be turning the bit to the right next week. If oil was $150 right now, you'd be running three rigs. You might have <laughs> four out there. So she's when she says, oh, we've done the best for oil and gas production, it's like, well, yeah, because prices have gone through the roof. Of course we're going to drill because I want some of that $100 oil. Absolutely. I hope we don't see $150 for the economy, okay? If we have the economy, the economy will crash. And as an operator, and more importantly, as an EMP company, an exploration and production company, those are numbers that just as a as an American, I don't want to see. But absolutely, when, when we get back to $100 oil, because it's going to happen, you will see us as an industry drill, baby, drill again. And pick up at least another 50 more rigs and only increase our production, increase our supply that Stu, you know, talks about all the time and filling back up our strategic petroleum reserve and also fight OPEC even more as they continue well, now to flirt with adding more barrels to the world. The Biden-Harris administration just several months ago, four months ago, eliminated the Northeastern strategic gasoline reserves. And they've been pouring that into the system and it's lowered the gasoline prices for this election. So guess what's going to happen on the next storm or the next time they try to borrow it? The prices are going to go through the roof exponentially mm. the other way. So what the Biden-Harris team have done right now is destroyed the strategic gasoline reserve, the strategic oil reserve will not be able to be refilled, period. The Biden administration, the Biden-Harris administration lied about filling the SPR just recently. They said, oh, we filled it up. No, they put an order out for 1.8 million barrels. And then they came back through and go, oh, no, we're going to no. And so it was a false number, just like their jobs numbers, where they had to recount a million jobs. Yeah, I, I think it all boils down to it's we're not, you know, basically, you know, VP Harris's position is trust me, I've got it right now. It's like, well, I don't know if I'm necessarily mm, no. that. Now, I about fell out of a chair when President Trump started and he says all those people in Springfield and Aurora. And I thought, don't mention the cats because I know that they're going to be ready for it. And they he did. He goes, they're eating the pets. And I mean, they that was a setup. And you, know, you, you can tell. I, I will say they, this. Yeah. It, he was debating three people tonight. Oh, they, they that's what late, I was about. They were. Late, they, they, did, uh, they did these fact checks out of nowhere. Like, uh, no, Mr. President, that didn't happen. You know, right, aw right away, they had that ready to go. Not to mention. Yep. The question, and I'm going to say this, the question on the race and the debate and the campaign campaign, that was a purely planted question that Kamala was 110 percent prepared for with a statement. I don't you know, you know, me oil as long as it's green, baby, I'm happy. You know what I mean? You know, I, as an I used company, to do. Yeah, I was in, uh, there. I said it. I, I hope I hope that's OK on the energy news. Oh, beat. absolutely. Uh, I was watching we, we body get that out if we need to. No, but, I you know, but he, everybody tonight, you know, yeah, and for for Michael Tanner, who's very even keel to even kind of go. Absolutely. Obviously, that was something there. I mean, considering, you know, if, if, if you compare me to Stu's Twitter feed, I'm a left. I'm a Marxist. But here's here's what I think. Here's another thing I found interesting was he was fighting all three moderators that was you know they're i mean i don't i wouldn't call it a fact check in real time but it it it, it might necessarily be that i do find it interesting that Stu, you talked about this and we talk about this a lot on the on on, on the show is you know natural gas is becoming a transition fuel and tonight we heard a democratic candidate tout natural gas production when it comes to being renewable so if you're if, if you haven't been vindicated up until for the last four years for saying that, now tonight you can finally vindicate because you got the Democratic, you know, central I, candidate admitting that natural gas is a transition fuel. 
Yeah. And I, I read it in the legislation three years ago and I said, this is coming. Yep. This is finally coming. They're going to have to admit that this is a, a renewable source. Yep. Guess what? And it's because that's how they're getting the new power plants put in because they're making them hydrogen ready. Yep. They'll never run hydrogen in those at all. <laughs> going to put hydrogen nukes in our cars. Yeah, that'll be fun. That'll be real fun. All right, RT, what else you got on this debate? Anything interesting that you, else you saw? Do you know what? No, I mean, other than the fact that, like I said, nothing swayed my vote left or right. I just kind of, again, wonder how many people actually watched that debate tonight that were like, this is going to be what makes my decision for me. She was prepared. I liked how he switched it on her when he goes, excuse me, I'm talking. I'm talking. Excuse me. Because that's run, run. during the, the Pence debate. And, you know, and Pence did a darn good job during that debate i think i've been on the uh, three podcasters before to say pence did a good job i don't know what happens in the white house right stays in the white house but he definitely did a good job there and he he debated against her back in 2020 very well but she was prepared i definitely feel like there was a little bit of a production that was going on on the team hair side of things you know they mentioned a lot about the hollywood people being there giving her tips maybe just because i heard that stuff I saw it, but she was prepared. But again, no substance, no policy was really shared. She basically reinvigorated that everything she was against in 2019, she's now for. And I'm sorry if your values are still the same. That's that's hogwash. That's a warning. Yes. Big, big warning. Hey, I want to give a shout out to Tyrus. I love Tyrus on the Gutfeld show. He was out there rolling around. He fi he uh, followed me this morning. So shout out to him. I'm, I've been interacting with him during this. Also want to give Gunther a shout out. I saw him on there and shot him a note. He's another big, he's in the, the room out there and Trump uh, tagged in right into the influencer room there in the at the debate and he was talking to him so it was kind of cool I, x i love me some x in interaction here you don't have to tell me that you <laughs> you, you you miss you, I, we could we could go on and on i don't really have anything else other than to say you know i think we know where trump stands he wants to drill baby drill you know it's he wants lower oil prices, whether that's good or bad for the industry versus the economy. Yep. That remains for each person to decide for themselves. But I will say this. The, the $55 oil or $50 oil can be profitable if you deal with inflation. You know, our right. we were at, a, we were at a, our, our good friend J.P. Warren's Connection Crew event, and that was a, an extremely hot topic being talked about was that – Yep. One of the big reasons profitability in the oil and gas business has gone down is not because prices have really gone crazy. They've actually been fairly range bound mm -hmm. from, you know, set, you know, 65 to 80. What's gone up is the insane cost of equipment. Labor's gone through the roof. Yeah. And right. so if you can bring down inflation, you can actually improve and maintain profitability, lower oil prices. Yeah, right. But we got to have security because of the, like the article that we just ran with the Venezuelan gang stealing in, in Midland in the field. That is affecting the supply line in security. It is going to be a huge security. We love our operators out there on the field. You got to keep them safe. Can't yeah. have, we got to, got to keep them from eating cats. You know, good grief. All right, RT, we'll give you the last word. Oh, I just want to say thank you very much to both of y'all for giving me the opportunity to be here. Stuart Turley, Michael Tanner, we listen to you here at the office every morning. Y'all keep it up. Y'all's articles, what y'all are doing is just amazing. So thank y'all just so much for the opportunity to be a guest and the first guest on the Energy News Beat. After uh, so four years. You. And I hope I didn't ruin it for others. <laughs> no, 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 no. We... Stu and I ruin it every single day, so we, we need to just change it up a little bit. All right, guys, well, we appreciate you checking us out here on the World's Greatest Podcast. We got to get to bed here because it's late. We will be back in the chair tomorrow for our final show of the week. Stu, who do you have coming up on Friday? Who, who are we dropping on Friday? A little oh, tease out? A little Gifford? tease out here. Give me one and a half seconds. Let's see what they got going. I think it's a good one. I think it's Gifford, right? I know Gifford's next week. I just okay. interviewed him today, which was outstandingly cool. And sorry, it's taking me so long. It's such a long list of people here. We are Doug Sandridge and Martin Helmenden out of, I filmed that one while they were in Norway. 
and uh, Norway has got a nuclear program that they're looking at. So it's pretty exciting. Right. Love ourselves some Doug Sandwich. But all right, guys, expect that on Friday. Otherwise, we will be back in the chair tomorrow for Stuart Turley. Special guest, Archie Trevino. I'm Michael Tanner. We'll see you guys tomorrow. <laughs> Adios.